I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Mike Hedges and Martin Kwok, who served as the re-recording mixer and the sound editor, respectively, of the Disney Plus documentary, The Beatles Get Back. Uh, first question I want to ask uh, is, uh, I'll put this to you first, Mike, and then Martin, uh, you can uh, respond as well after that. Uh, did you have a relationship with the music of The Beatles before you started working on this film? Uh, great question, Charlie. Um, I've I've grown up with the Beatles. I love the Beatles uh, music, and it's 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 something that's iconic. and And I've always looked upon, you know, John, Paul, Ringo, and George as 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 great musicians. But I just love the the simple simplicity of their music and and how much um, creativity was in was put into their track. So yeah, I loved it. I think for me. Um, as a music fan, there was a whole bunch of the Beatles catalog that I knew implicitly, but I didn't actually grow up with the Beatles per se. Like uh, in my house, there was a lot more jazz uh, from, from my parents. Uh, and then I found my own way with music. But what I inevitably found over time is all of that music has already seeped into your system. It's like osmosis. You know, even if you're not growing up with the Beatles on the hi-fi every day, it's, it's just within you. And so then getting to the project as a, a music fan, but not a huge Beatles nut, um, it was an experience where I was able to really dig in and uh, appreciate so much more about the band and, and where they come from. Yeah. And uh, Martin, I'll put this next one uh, to you first. Um, how long did it take each of you to complete the sound work on this from when you first started to when you were to when you were finished with everything on your end of the, on your end of the responsibilities? <laughs> Right. Um, well, in 2019, uh, the, the first uh, eyes on it from a sound point of view was uh, um, Brent Burge and Stephen Gallagher, one of the supervising sound editors and um, the music editor. Um, and they got shown day four, which was a pretty long cut at that point in time. Uh, and their minds were blown and suddenly uh, the world of Beatles and that, that get back period was opened up to them. So that was in, I think about June or July of 2019. I joined on around August, uh, September of that year. And at that point we worked on a few sequences and then put the rooftop together as a effectively something to pitch to studios and so forth. Um, and I think we would have mixed that mic around uh, October, November. Um, at about the same time that uh, uh, Peter and uh, Claire Olsen, the producer, were up in London working through a few other things with, uh, I think, around the time that um, They Shall Not Grow Old was still doing some, some work up there. Um, uh, but um, so there was a little burst in 2019 and then we put the project down for a lot of 2020, which because the pandemic had closed things down effectively, uh, and then came back to it in earnest at the end of that year. Um, and following that all of last year, basically from January through to the day we delivered and, you know, like uh, late October, November of 2021, we were just hammer and tongs on the Beatles project. It was a very small crew, um, but uh, all the right resources, um, all the right people to actually add the right skill bases to what we needed to do for that project. Right. Right. Well, we, um, as Marty said, I think our time frame is a similar. Um, the first experience when Peter showed it to us just as, as little clips and things was in 2019. Then to work on the rooftop. Um, and again, we didn't have Peter around at the beginning of that process. We, uh, we put it together as a concert uh, for, for a viewing to the, to Apple, to Jonathan from Apple and, uh, and also to the Beatles themselves. Um, Paul and Ringo, uh, wanted to have a look just to make sure that Peter was on the right track, I think. And, um, it, it, it grew from there. The rooftop was a stunning start, uh, 2020 pandemic, which gave Peter more time to cut more stuff into it. Um, and we saw it again when it suddenly had had bloomed uh, from, from, from a two hour to, I think at that time, probably a six hour and then it grew again. So yeah, um, as, as Marty said, right up till the time we delivered, in fact, uh, we, we, were, we were telling stories to uh, Apple and Disney uh, in, at, at late night conferences to, to make sure that we could actually have another day uh, in, on the stage with Peter. 
um, and and it was uh, it was right up to the wire. Uh, so, uh, Mike, I'm gonna. Uh, this this is this question specifically for you. Um, what was the initial audio quality of the footage, and what ended up being your main responsibility in getting this audio mixed in the right way? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, the uh, initial field tapes um, from Peter Sutton, who was a recordist, uh, were Nagra. Um, quarter inch tapes and he kept recording everything the quality of that stuff was was as you can imagine um reasonably reasonably covered in a lot of music it wasn't that clear of what was happening there were there were scenes where you could not understand the vocal because of what was um also being um, um recorded at the time guitars and all of that stuff and and our main job, um, and thank God we did have the time to get machine learning in a much better state. And our, my, my main focus was really on intelligibility of dialogue in the first instance. And then what we were trying to do in, this, in the track was actually generate what those guys would have heard in the studio. If you were in a, in a band setting like that, you've got drums that would be really loud. You've got guitars and you've got everything and the vocals would be, would be sort of second, secondary. So, you know, we started with really noisy, um, poor quality and what we were trying to give the, the audience, and I think we, we, we obtained a pretty good result, was the experience of what they would have heard on their stage. You would have heard, you would have heard a mix where you'd hear all the drums. In the, in the originals, you couldn't hear the drums, and Ringo made a comment at one stage about, now I can hear my drums, and, and uh, <laughs> I think that was a, quite a compliment because what we were able to do is separate all of the different elements um, and, and balance it uh, to, to an acceptable standard. And, and remember, we, we've got to impress the Beatles here. You know, we, we, there are so many Beatle fans out there that if we stuffed this up, you know, uh, we, would, we, would, <laughs> we would not be popular. So our end result was a balance of, of great vocal, of, of drums, of guitars, um, and being a fly on the wall in that room. Uh, so, it, yeah, it was quite a task. That was my main main job, really. Yeah, we had the benefit of uh, also having uh, the ear of Charles Martin, uh, who, you know, again, through the sense of, uh, almost a sense of osmosis, really understands the Beatles implicitly through uh, his father, uh, George Martin's work with the band and has been a custodian of the work. So we were able to get feedback um, from uh close to the source. And we quickly knew that we were on the right path, particularly once we'd started to develop the uh, machine learning um, breakthrough to be able to mm -hmm. effectively, what we were trying to do there was separate the, the voice so we could tell Peter's narrative. You know, I want to hear what John's saying over there, but it's covered in guitars and it's covered in mm -hmm. drums. And it's like, yep, well, as a mono uh, uh, <laughs> Nagra file, there was no way to deal with that. There was. It was like audio fatigue coming at you, too much information. But once we actually got the breakthrough with machine learning, we were able to separate those layers and then edit as well as mix in a way that we could help that intelligibility and clarity for the storytelling as well as the music and therefore the audience. Mm. And actually, I was uh, just about to ask uh, you, Martin, uh, kind of a similar question of, of what, what uh, duties as a sound editor uh, did you have dealing when you're dealing specifically with archival footage? Mm. Well, yeah, I think it's it's as Mike was saying. Like the the key is that intelligibility factor. Um, Peter is very much a storyteller. He's a filmmaker, and as well as a documentarian and, and, and historian with, within uh, the, the setting that we've been in with the Beatles. Uh, but most importantly, there is a story to be told, um, and that's the narrative that he and Jabez found through all of that footage and all of that audio. So my job, uh, specifically from a dialogue editor's point of view, was to ensure that that was something that could be understood intelligent, and uh, you know, the intelligibility of that uh, dialogue was uh, paramount. Uh, so that was almost a impossible feat, I've got to say, uh, in 2019, when we when we first listened to those uh, original Mononagras, I, I did not really see a clear way to be able to do that. 
um, with the advent of uh, all the neural network, uh, artificial intelligence stuff that was starting to happen around the world. Uh, we were very, very lucky to have some smart uh, guys on the team, Emile Delaray and Andrew Moore, who uh, once we started to go down that road, went deep and we were all pitched in as a team and started to uh, realign our approach to audio restoration with regard to the machine learning that we were going through. And it went in leaps and bounds. It was sort of like getting a Wrights Brothers plane off the ground and then suddenly going, guess what we're building? We're building a, a, a Boeing out of this as we're over water. So the technology got a lot better uh, as we were going and it informed the way that we were editing sound. And it also enhanced the way we were able to mix that sound into, well, starting with a mono source, but then we wanted it to be in a Dolby Atmos um, environment and give people you know that spatial experience so yeah without the machine learning we would have had a lot of trouble uh telling that story but um everything happened just at the right time and uh mike uh i'll, I'll put this to you uh first and then martin you can add anything that you would like to as well um how much of your jobs were intertwined with working with the series uh editor who you uh who we heard mentioned before uh james olsen yeah, Jabez is is really Peter's right hand, um, and therefore our, our uh, really a big contributor to what we what we uh, achieved. Um, Jabez is probably the second biggest Beatles fan in the world, apart from Peter Jackson. So uh, it was it was great to have his insight because um, and and you know they've been working on this for a number of years and know the track intimately. And when we, 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 we didn't know it as well as those guys, obviously. So to have Jabez come in, review a reel without Peter there and just, and just give us a little heads up on, on the reason why Peter wanted a particular track or a particular narrative was very, very helpful. Um, and we, we, as we've gone on and, and we've worked with Jabez for a number of years as well, um, we find his... Uh, he was. He started out as a very quiet sort of editor, which is surprising when you get to know picture editors. Um, they, <laughs> they, uh, they have a, a strong voice. And and by the time that we got to the end, Jabez was uh, very insightful in 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 looking at uh, details and uh, just having little ads. And or well, the other thing that we really appreciate about Jabez, because there are obviously you can appreciate sync issues with um, a lot of this stuff because you've got so many different timestamps and different different pieces coming in um and 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 particularly with music you've got guys playing instruments that sometimes would not look in sync and we were able to work with jabers and roll shots and just move things and suggest um a better way uh, once we had clarified the music a little bit he was able to actually roll shots for us and 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 uh it was a very collaborative experience um you'd say that marty absolutely yeah no it's a great collaboration um working with uh, the cutting room in that regard peter and jabers have a, a you know a 20-year history of working together and actually so do we on the sound side so there comes with that a great sense of trust from the cutting room of what they hand mm -hmm. over to us they know that we're going to uh, look after the work and push it in the right direction and if we're not on the right path then we find out pretty quickly at a playback and I was really pleased to get through almost all of those playbacks and know that actually we were on the right path uh, and I think yeah. that comes down to the shorthand that we've developed over uh, you know all, all the you know two decades of working together um, mm. where we were able to because uh, they were busy cutting you know, I, I couldn't always just sort of pick up the phone and go, Jabez, what are we trying to do with this scene? There were times that we had to box on and put our best foot forward. Um, but knowing pretty much implicitly where we should be heading. And I think for the most part, Peter and Jabez were really pleased with the uh, what we were able to do with the picture edit that they'd given us. And as Mike was saying, the collaboration with taking some of those shots and then going, if we roll this six frames this way it'll just bring the music back into sync and some of those fine tuning parts that uh both peter and jabers will put their hands up and say we're not we're not music people we're not uh you know music uh, video uh mtv guys um so there was 
people on our side that we were able to help realign some of that and it became a really nice stance between picture and sound editorial which mm-hmm. eventuated in a mix process which uh, they were, everybody was happy with yeah sure. um uh, so uh last question i want to ask it's actually to you mike uh, we are an awards site and uh, you have the dis- you have the distinction of having won two Oscars, both for uh, sound mixing for uh, Peter Jackson movies, one for Lord of the Rings: Return of the King, and the other for King Kong. I was just wondering if you could just uh, just talk about what that experience was like for you. Wow, uh, yeah, it's been a long long history, and you know when when we first started work, working with Peter, we never dreamed of a- Academy Awards or anything of the like. And um, I always remember, you know, to win them is, is stunning. Uh, to win an Academy Award, you're voted on by your peers first to get a nomination. And then for the Academy and the world to acknowledge it as top of your field, boy, it certainly uh, changes your life and your, and your experiences. But the one moment I, I had a reality check was when we were at the BAFTAs uh, for uh, Return of the King and we didn't win. And, and and I thought we should have won, and and I can remember uh, at the bar afterwards with Peter. He pulled us all together, and oh, he, he said, "Look, guys, we never went into this to win awards, but for three years in a row, Lord of the Rings took out the People's Choice Award at the Baftas." And he said to me, "That's what we make movies for." And suddenly, it would just brought your feet back onto the ground, and God, you know, we're about. We're about doing the best we can, and if people love what we do, and and we we've done the right job, and and mm. it's accumulated in two Academy Awards and a whole lot of other stuff. But my biggest thrill is is knowing that Peter trusts us, and we can work on any motion picture in the world. We've worked on, you know, with Spielberg, and we're working with other great directors, and they acknowledge the the degree of integrity that we bring to a product. And, and they under, you know, when you're working with somebody so closely, who's so passionate, it just rubs off on you and you, you're able to bring your talents and abilities to, to, to the table and uh, we create some great stuff. So yeah, life-changing. Well, uh, Mike and Martin, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best uh, during this award year's award season and to all of our viewers, please like this video, smash that subscribe button, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions for this year's Emmys. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks very much, Charlie.